What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another video with me, Ben Rogajan, aka the Seattle Data Guy. Today, we're going to talk about the realities of living in Silicon Valley. Now, despite my name being the Seattle Data Guy, I'm actually currently hidden away in the mountains of Colorado, which I happen to find myself here due to all of the last events over the last two years, thanks to work from home and that definition of home being very ambiguous over the last two years. I've traveled a little bit, going about two or three months per location, staying in Airbnbs, which was, I think, a little bit cheaper when I was originally doing it. I feel like now it's become a little more popular as people are still wondering when work from home will be over for some companies, as it seems like Amazon, Facebook, Google, and I think even Netflix all seem to not be planning to go back for at least until next year. So people are trying to get that last little bit of maybe open travel out there. But in between that, I did happen to live in Silicon Valley, specifically in the Menlo Park area. So I wanted to give everyone out there who maybe might be moving soon, thanks to work from home, hopefully being over soon, fingers crossed, and you might find yourself moving for a job in Silicon Valley. So you might be wondering, what is this new life going to be like? Is Silicon Valley the land of milk and honey or nerds and data? And the obvious answer is um, clearly nerds and data. You've not watched enough HBO to not understand that Silicon Valley is very much like the show in so many ways. And we're about to dive into the realities of living in Silicon Valley, the good, the bad, the ugly, because really like any place, there's good things, there's bad things. And if being in a tech monoculture is your thing, it's a great place because that's where we're going to start this conversation, which is it really does tend to feel like a tech monoculture. And what do I mean by that? It's everyone kind of feels like they're the same person or maybe the same two or three types of people. There are the more tech bros in terms of people who maybe learned how to program because they learned it was a lot of money or just learned in college, which maybe that's where I fit into because I just learned in college in terms of programming. There are the Bane type programmers who literally have been programming since they came into this world and set up Linux servers on the weekends for fun. And then you have people like boot campers and other groups of programmers as well, all of which, again, some form of developer or another, but they're all kind of talking about the same problem. So you're either talking about development and software engineering, or maybe you're talking about more of the startup side of it, but really it feels like everyone's conversation that you're around, even your Uber driver <laughs> is talking about their startup or their coding boot camp that they're doing on the weekends. It just feels like that is in the lifeblood of Silicon Valley. It feels like everyone who is anyone is learning how to program. And it becomes even more apparent when you go to the second point I'm gonna make, which is dating. Now, if you want to feel like everyone is a programmer in the Bay Area, just start swiping through your favorite dating app and you'll see data scientists, data engineer, software engineer, software engineer, CEO, startup CEO, and so on and so forth. And that's the fun thing, especially if you feel like as a guy, you're like, well, I'm making well over six figures. And since for some reason you view your only worth in this world being connected to the amount of money you make or the title you have, you really don't stand out that much when everyone else is making more money than you. Because if you feel like your 200K salary is a lot, well, just wait until you see the 500K salary that a senior software engineer has at least according to the tech lead. So if you're basing your competitiveness in the dating world purely on how smart you are or how much money you're making, everyone else in the Bay Area is a programmer and making just as much, if not more than you. So you better learn how to have a sense of humor because there are so many other qualities that matter other than the number in your bank account. But it's kind of an interesting thing to see in terms of dating because again, it, it is funny to see that everyone kind of has a very similar role. But before I probably get in trouble with a certain someone, I should probably not talk too much about my dating experience in Silicon Valley. Coffee. And I say this as someone from Seattle who basically has coffee running through his veins and drinks coffee at eight o'clock at night happily and then goes to bed at midnight easily. San Francisco actually has decent coffee. You've got things like Phil's, which if you've watched again, Silicon Valley, you will actually see that they reference and go to. One of the first things I realized when I rewatched Silicon Valley in Silicon Valley was like, oh my God, Phil's, I've been there and their mint mojito is delicious. But they also have things like Blue Bottle and Verve. If you happen to be working at Facebook, which has a Verve inside of it, you do have to pay for that coffee though. Unlike 99% of the other coffee at Facebook, we do have some internal coffee shops that we do have to pay for that are like Blue Bottle and Verve, but it's convenient to have them near, especially near the sweet shop. So you can pay $5 for a cup of coffee, but get a free piece of pie with it. So, hey, some of it was free. 
And so, yes, I really do enjoy the coffee in the Bay Area, which I've actually found is not always true as I've been into other states at this point, where sometimes you're surprised to find that what they call coffee is some combination of dirt and shikari or something and has zero kick to it whatsoever. But I guess I am just a little bit of a coffee snob. Now, of course, a discussion of Silicon Valley would be nothing without referencing how freakishly expensive it is to live there. Now, as I first moved into the area, I was provided a kind of like housing consultant who basically took me around so that I could see different rental options that I could go to and live in. And as I was going and seeing $2,800 studios that were 500 square feet with no form of laundry inside them, I was borderline crying, realizing I was about to have to spend nearly $36,000 a year on rent. So yes, living in the Bay Area can be very expensive. Luckily for me, I happened to find two other roommates. So I was able to find a place that was only $4,500 for three people. So we got to split that amongst three. And so $1,500 was a little more reasonable. Although I'm paying about the same here for a single bedroom all to myself, fully functional with AC and a laundry machine, which again, seem to be like extras in Silicon Valley, which is another thing to point out, which is it gets a lot hotter than you think in Silicon Valley. Again, despite my housing consultant saying, you do not need AC. By the time it was March, it was quickly 100 degrees and I definitely bought a $500 AC unit to put into my room because it was unbearable to sleep at night. So it does get very hot there. It's very close to San Jose. And despite San Francisco itself often being somewhere in the range of 10 degrees cooler, lower in the bay does get quite hot in summer. Just to add to the ridiculousness of SF costs, let's talk about buying a house. And in fact, I recall seeing an ad on Zillow for a house that was going for $1.5 million. And in the description of this house, they literally reference it as a fixer upper. I don't often see real estate agents using the term fixer upper in the description of a house unless they really have to use it, right? Like other times they'll use terms like charming or rustic or something to hide the fact that the property is old. Here, they were literally outlining that a $1.5 million house was a fixer upper. And in my brain, I'm just like, where am I getting the other $500,000 to even think about fixing this? Like, I'm going to pay that 1.5 and then probably need 500K just to fix this. I don't have the 1.5 to begin with, and now I need to find 500K more. So yes, the Bay is ridiculously expensive. And although the last two years have, I think, kind of dropped it a bit, from what I understand, it's going straight back up again. And for everyone who says it's not sustainable, I don't think you understand how much money people in the Bay are making and how sustainable it has been and will continue to be. Now, after your busy 11 to 3, five day a week schedule, you're going to want to go out and do things on the weekend. And there are some things like nature does exist somewhere in the Bay Area. Like you can often drive to it, but it always feels like it's unnecessarily far away. Like you always have to drive either like to Yellowstone, it feels like, or Sonoma or somewhere just farther away than I'd like to drive. I would really like to at least see nature close by. I think it's one reason I do like Colorado and Seattle because you can see the mountains off in the distance and it doesn't feel like it takes you that long to get to a hike. I mean, in Seattle, it feels like you can drive five minutes away from your house and get attacked by a bear. So it's nice in terms of having that great combination of city to nature ratio. Whereas I would say in the Bay, it's really just a lot of suburban area. Really, for those who don't actually understand the geography of the Bay, I would often reference the fact that I live somewhere in San Francisco, but I lived arguably 20 to 30 miles away from San Francisco in Menlo Park, but it's just so much easier to reference San Francisco than Menlo Park. And actually I didn't even live in Menlo Park. I lived in Redwood City, which was right next to it. And again, most people who, if you hadn't lived in California would probably not even know where these cities are. But basically you have this 50 mile stretch from San Francisco to San Jose that's super expensive and all just a bunch of suburban area. And it personally just feels too tight sometimes. But I guess I can't complain because I have not had to live in New York City yet. And of course that distance between Menlo Park and San Francisco makes it really hard if you enjoy the nightlife. You either have to decide to live in the city and commute 30 miles in every day in traffic that probably easily takes you one and a half hours in one direction or live in Menlo Park and commute into the city over the weekends. I did have a few events where I would go down to the city and it was terrible to have to drive all the way down 
and it wasn't a lot of fun to drive on the weekends while everyone else was going to enjoy the city and a typical 30 minute drive would suddenly become two hours as you were just waiting to get into the city so there is a nightlife and it can be a lot of fun if you happen to live downtown but you are stuck with that classic trade-off of either living downtown and having a two-hour commute to work if you work at companies like google or facebook which most of their positions are generally outside of the city or living outside of the city and having to drive in. Now, a lot of this might come off a little negative, but I honestly did enjoy my time in the Bay Area. There really is an energy and just a sense of optimism as everyone seems to be starting some form of startup. Everyone just is filled with so much hope as they're trying to drive to some solution for problems that they maybe created in their brains or maybe really do exist. And everyone seems to be either talking about funding or working for a fang or they're just is this constant energy in terms of technology and focus on that. And honestly, everyone you do meet in the Bay Area tends to be very intelligent when it comes to things like software engineering, programming, startup design, business strategy, and just all of these things that really are exciting. So if you want to go to a place where that kind of energy exists, it's honestly a lot of fun. And if you're making a decent salary, honestly, even spending $30,000 a year won't impact your bottom line that much. And you'll probably still end up putting more money away than if you had worked somewhere else, making maybe half the amount that a lot of these jobs will pay you. Of course, with all this work from home, we'll see if companies end up bending towards the idea of paying people the same, regardless of the state that they live in. I mean, I would love that because I do not want to have to pay California's 10% state tax anymore. I mean, if we look at the real rate, I do think it is closer to seven or 8%, but still it, is close enough to 10 that I'm going to say 10. So if you have a job offer at the Bay and it's comparable and can cover you, I'd say go ahead and live there for a year or two. It's a lot of fun. Enjoy it. I personally still want to go live in New York for a year because it's like, while you're young, do it. And eventually you can pick somewhere like Colorado or Seattle to live in with a family. And with that, guys, I just want to say thank you so much for your attention. Please like, subscribe, and share this video if you enjoyed it. Tell me what you did in the comments below to try to keep yourself from going stir crazy. Again, for me, I kind of try to travel every few months, but maybe you did something else. Thank you guys all, and I will see you next time, and goodbye.